Well, good afternoon. My name is Mark McInerney. I'm part of uh, NASA Goddard Space Flight Center. And Peter Griffith uh, and actually Liz were unable to attend AGU this year, so I'm part of the technical team. And uh, this is going to be an overview of ABOVE, which is the Arctic Boreal Vulnerability Experiment and how it's going to interface with in-situ data networks. Um, and we also have a technical component that we're bringing to this uh, solicitation, if you were already aware. So this is an overview of ABOVE and the solicitation that's, that's going to be out. Actually, it is out. It came out the, this month. So I don't normally read from my charts, but this one I'm going to since I'm part of the technical team and this is uh, really what breaks down the above uh, campaigns and the solicitation. So let's just read it. It says, uh, above is the next NASA uh, terrestrial ecolo ecological field campaign focused on environmental changes in uh, Antarctic boreal, boreal regions of the western uh, North America with impl implications in ecological systems and society. Wow, that was easier to read by myself when it stands up here. Uh, so really, the overarching question is uh, how vulnerable or resilient are ecosystems and society to environmental change in the Arctic boreal region of Western North America? And that's what the question the above campaign is, is looking to, to, to answer. So the overarching science objective, right, is the uh, investigation and the underlying processes and their interactions that control vulnerability, resilience in the Arctic boreal system of, north, of what Western North America to environmental change and to access how people within the boundary, excuse me, access from beyond the region may respond to changes in these processes and interactions. Well, I need glasses too. All right, so that's what it is. So this, this right here is an image of the actual uh, campaigns region. So, you know, the core of the red and the, the extended region is in purple and it spans the environmental gradients variations common to the Arctic and, and boreal ecosystems. Um, if you look on the, uh, on the right, there's bolded uh, items which are the key environmental gradient variations and in, in bold are the gradients that are within the in-situ networks. So say, you know, physical climate weather, permafrost extents, some ground ice uh, content and the stream flow. Um, you know, these boundaries were developed based on the uh, geographic and political boundaries of the region. That's how they were selected. And, you know, this is a solicitation, so you can see uh, this chart and the next chart really reinforce the same idea, but there are gaps uh, in these areas for in situ data. So, you know, this, in this solicitation that's going out, uh, you know, scientists can propose, you know, and uh, if they ultimately win, we'll be expected to. Um, tie into these in situ networks, follow their standard data protocols. Uh, we're not trying to reinvent the wheel here. It's just filling the gaps of where data is needed. All right, so this is the greening and browning background, um, really just reinforcing the same idea of the of, uh, of the gaps that we have in data in this region and why the solicitation is out. And of course, the green and browning shows the vegetation is changing throughout the Arctic boreal regions, where some areas are warming, uh, allowing shrubs to expand, say, in the Arctic tundra, while others are seeing decreases in vegetation. You know, these changes will result in changes in, in flux measurements throughout the time and space during the campaign. So, again, lots of gaps in data. If you are so inclined to propose to the solicitation, you could help fill those gaps, among other things that the solicitation uh, would provide. Now, I'm not part of that solicitation process. Again, I'm part of the technical team. And so I'm really excited to talk about how we're going to integrate some of the technical components of this as far as data collection processing. So this is just an image that uh, Highlights that you know, uh, satellite, you know, from basically from spacecraft to aircraft to ground data, you know, there's a, a lot of um, uh, a lot of uh, observations that can be used for this region. It's just a cartoon to show that. All right, so this is kind of more of where my area is. Um, again, I said I'm from Goddard Space Flight Center, and specifically out of the high performance computing area. Um, it's the uh, Computational Information Science and Technologies Office, specifically where we're at. And myself, I'm on the soft side of this activity. In other words, collecting data, pushing data, um, manipulating data, presenting it, data management, things of this nature. And my colleague, Dan Duffy, 
is in the system side, uh, who actually leads the high performance computing, but also this specific uh, computing environment for the above campaign, uh, which we're going to talk about here now. Um, before we start talking about the, the actual system that is being stood up to support the above campaign and the scientists that will propose to it, um, we do have a data management life cycle. Um, we're really past the planning now. Uh, the call for proposals is out. Um, so uh, there's a website at the end. I'll say it now. It's above.nasa.gov, but it's also listed on the last chart. So if you're interested in learning more, you'll have that opportunity to go there and look. Um, but now, you know, the selections, you know, everything from getting selected, <clears throat> then uh, collecting the data, QCing the data, analyzing the data. And then the idea, right, is if you have created science data that others can use, you're going to publish that in an archive, say a DAC, right? And now I'm at the bottom. Um, I don't have a, oh, I do have a laser pointer. So down here now. So, but we have a feedback loop, right? So we can get back in for using the system that we're setting up. It'll allow, uh, you know, new observations to be pumped back into the campaign's effort so scientists can use it right away. So what are we building? So we're building a high performance science cloud or science cloud or above cloud. We kind of use those inter interchangeably at the moment. And it's uh, a really exciting project um, that's bringing a lot of uh, capability to the science community specifically for the above campaign and others uh, beyond that once we, once we get there. And it's, adjunct, it's, it's, it's adjacent to the NCCS high performance computing environment. You know, if you ever worked in a high performance computing environment, it does take a little bit of a learning curve to you know, convert your, your code to run in that environment. This is different, right? So this is, it's, it's a virtual machine environment, not necessarily exactly like a Amazon cloud as far as use, because it is a virtual machine environment where Amazon, you'd go in and you would provision your own resources. We do provision for you at the, po at the point, but uh, it does lower, nevertheless, does lower the bar barrier for science uh, scientists to get in and use it uh, has custom customized runtime environments. So we prefer Linux, different flavors of Linux. It can actually run Microsoft. There's you know licensing hurdles we have to deal with, but uh, it's a really flexible uh, and powerful environment that's tied to the above campaign. So scientists can actually uh, you know run, they don't have to worry about the technology to, to do their work as far as the data pushing, pulling, and manipulating. Um, what I really like, and I think this is key to success of this, is it's reusable uh, HPC or Discover hardware, which is the high performance computing system at NASA Goddard. I, I don't know the exact life cycle, two, three, four years, depending on which purchase it was. Uh, these high performance computing nodes are decommissioned, and we often Give, give those to other universities or whatnot. Uh, it's on my domain to decide that, but we take a large portion of that and cycle it into this uh, cloud computing environment, so it's, in essence, free compute, right? Well, when you have free compute, you can do a lot with that. So the uh, scientists really, um, in, in, the far, in the right, well, there's another chart we're going to talk about this a little bit more, but basically this is uh, compute over vast amounts of data, data storage. So scientists won't have to worry about the compute or the storage, they just bring their algorithms uh, uh, to, the, to the actual cloud. Um, it has extendable storage, so we can build up, build out, um, expand as needed. There's a persistent data services built in these virtual machines for data distribution and others. We can create purpose-built purpose -built VMs for specific science projects. And I like to look at this as software as a service. If you have uh, common tools or services that um, scientists are using, you build it into a common virtual machine environment, they can pull it off the shelf and they can use it. Now you don't have to, not only do you don't have to worry about setting up uh, technical environments for your individual project or the storage for individual project, but now you don't have to worry about installing all the data, that's, uh, excuse me, the uh, well, data too, but the, uh, the tools you'll use since they're common. And real quick, there's a difference. I'm sure some of you are wondering why not just use the Amazon Cloud or whatnot. There, most of you may know that there are we're talking large amounts of data. In the next slide, we'll talk a little bit more about that. But you know, when you, when you move a lot of data into the Amazon Cloud, process it, and pull it out, it's going to cost you a lot. Uh, so this uh, avoids that. Uh, it's also fast. It's close to HPC levels of performance. There's critical node-to-node -node communications with high speed, low latency. Um, 
and of course the, the shared high performance file system. And the system owns the data. I think the next one I can explain a little bit more about what that means. Um, well, it's not there, but I can, I can talk to it. Um, it's kind of recapping what it is. So let me say real quick is the, the core of uh, storage at this point is three petabytes of, of storage that we have uh, purchased and it's on the shelf. So the idea here is that, I don't know if you all face this, but when sci I, I've seen over and over and over scientists have to individually pull the same data. Uh, pick your common in situ network, pick your you know, MODIS data, MIRA data, whatever your project is, it takes weeks, months, lots of months to pull down that data, which is expensive as far as your schedule. So what we're doing here at the cloud, we know that there's common data sets that people want to use for this above campaign. We're staging all that. I think my last check was 500 terabytes of data has already been staged. And um, we're continually increasing that and trying to anticipate what the scientists may need. But if it's common when the proposals come in, we'll go ahead and pull that first so that you don't have to. So that's a big time saver. So the core variables, uh, let me just talk a little bit about that, right? So um, core variables for above represent important and uh, often undersampled Arctic boreal environmental characteristics. Um, above will have core variable sites to ensure monitoring within the study domain, but we'll also uh, use measurements from current in situ data networks. You know, these are, include things such as the I, uh, former life, I spent 15 years at the Weather Service, and we all know there's a vast amount of weather data out there, as some of the previous speakers had, had alluded to. So weather station records, you know, uh, hydrometric data, hydrometeorological data, um, including, you know, water quality data, borehole temperature data, things of this nature. Those are what we would like to stage, since we know it's the data in that region, we stage what we have, and uh, that'll be there for the scientists so they don't have to worry about it. And I have the lights, I'm just going to go on to the last chart here. So really in summary, this is just to bring awareness to the above uh, solicitation that's out. Um, and the, in the above, uh, will contribute to in-situ networks and utilize uh, current community standards in order to accelerate the science within the science cloud as well. And I encourage you to go to above.nasa.gov if you have any other questions, uh, there's contact information there, or you can also reach out to me and I can, uh, I can funnel you to the right people. So. Thank you.